Welcome to the program. I'm Jeff Sheckman. How much of your workday is about email, text, Slack, Basecamp, or Shift? How much of time is spent in phone calls or meetings or basic human contact? If you're like most people today, a large portion is devoted to apps, to screens, and to technology, and less and less to human contact. How many times have you sent a work text or email to someone yards or even feet away? All of this comes with a price. It disconnects us over and over again so that we begin to lose the basic skills of human contact and interaction. The price we pay is not just in the workplace, but in the very act of being human. We're going to talk about all of this today with my guest, Dan Shawbell. Dan Shawbell is a best-selling author. He's a partner and research director at Future Workplace and the founder of both Millennial Branding and Workplace Trends. He's written for numerous publications and has consulted with Fortune 500 companies. It is my pleasure to welcome Dan Shawbell here to talk about his new book, Back to Human, How Great Leaders Create Connection in an Age of Isolation. Dan, thanks so much for joining us. Happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you here in a world in which we've gotten used to, certainly millennials have, doing almost everything through our phones, whether it's getting a car to drive or getting dinner delivered or getting dates. What's different today in terms of the, the lack of human contact that you're seeing? The technology has made us addicted to it because that's the business model of Apple and Google and Microsoft and all the big tech companies. Every time we hear a ding or just see an alert, it activates our brain and we want more and more of it. It releases dopamine and pleases our reward system. And we're looking at our phones and tapping them over 2,600 times a day. We're sending five texts during a business meeting. So we're addicted to it. We like the convenience of it. And you know, that's why people will listen to a podcast. Well, Typing up an email, they just they just want more and more of it, and it can be very unhealthy and get in the way of real human face-to-face -face interactions that we need to thrive and survive. Talk about the ways in which research is beginning to show that it's unhealthy, because it's one thing to say that it is, and there is a general assumption that it is certainly different than the way things used to be. But what evidence do we have that it's unhealthy? So I talked to the former U.S. Surgeon General, Vivek Murthy, and he said that there's a loneliness epidemic, which is partially caused by technology. And loneliness has the health, same health risk and reduction of lifespan as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. And there's another study in the U.S. of Americans that uh, would rather break a bone than their cell phone. So they would you know, rather hurt themselves than lose their phone. We're so addicted to it that if you leave it at a restaurant or in a cab, that there's a huge panic and that creates the anxiety and stress and is bad for you and just not having it uh, makes you feel like, you know, you can't do anything when decades ago we didn't have phones and we still lived. Is there a counterintuitive aspect of this that in fact what our phones do and what all of this technology does is it puts us in contact with people more than we used to be, that there's a positive side to all of this? Yeah, that's the illusion of the connection. I think it, technology can do great things, right? They, they interviewed 100 top young leaders, and they said technology is a double-edged sword. It can be good or bad depending on how, when, and where you use it. So I think that it can keep us in touch with people, but the problem is a lot of people are overusing it, and it creates the illusion that we have an abundance of friends, like Facebook friends, when really we can only count on four at a time of emotional crisis out of 150 on average. And it makes us think that we have strong bonds, yet many are weak ties. And the more and more we use technology, the less and less we're spending time picking up the phone or having FaceTime, which is so critical to our development as humans and especially in the workplace when, you know, if you're sending so many emails back and forth, there's clearly some misunderstanding and it can be counterproductive. What does this do for us? What is the impact when we do have face-to-face -face conversation, when we do have personal interaction today? Yeah. So if you don't see or hear from someone for three, four, or five days, you feel socially awkward the next time you're around them. And this is what's happened to me. It's happened to you know people I know. And so you have to kind of practice your social skills. Uh, otherwise, your social skill muscle will atrophy. So I think it's important that 
we take control of the technology and use the technology as a bridge to human interaction, not let it be a barrier, let it get you to a physical space. But when you're in that networking event, the birthday party, the, you know, company, all hands of that, you're actually uh, present and you're talking with the people that will most impact your life and career. What impact are companies finding? What impact are, are companies realizing that this has in the workplace in terms of employee productivity? It has a, a huge impact. I mean, there, it's the reason why Apple invested in their new headquarters that fits 12,000 employees with the purpose of having employees walk and bump into each other in the hallways to form conversations, new ideas, and breakthroughs. Uh, Amazon has like the Amazon Rainforest is kind of like a greenhouse in Seattle uh, where uh, there's over a thousand different types of plants and you can book a, a quote unquote conference room in the greenhouse and then actually sit down and, and you know, feel at peace with, with your surroundings and have genuine conversations. What's fascinating is if you take people outside of the normal traditional office space, they open up much more and feel free. And one of what's happening overall is a third of the global workforce works remote, yet two thirds are just engaged and feel isolated. And so more and more work is being decentralized because of technology. Technology has powered the remote workforce. And that's left a lot of people feeling lonely and isolated and disconnected from not just their teams and organizations, but just from society as a whole. One of the things that we hear about in the workplace today, in addition to all of this technology and all the things we've been talking about, is that there's more and more teamwork going on, that more and more work is being done by groups or teams within organizations, particularly large organizations. How does this square with this broader issue we've been looking at? Yeah, it's, it's actually a good insight and question. You know, all work is done in teams now. You know, even if you're a freelance slash gig economy worker, you're starting to partner up with other freelancers in order to accomplish bigger goals. So everything's in teams and you're working with people and the best skill you could ever learn is how to work and manage people right? because you're going to be interacting with them throughout the, the course of your life. And so in terms of a, a team, it's about using the technology to collaborate, but then also at the same time, making sure that you have that one phone call every Monday like I have with my team that, you know, for us, we have four events every year at Future Workplace where we're meeting not just our team and business partners, but clients. And if the clients don't see us for a long period of time, they're not going to be our clients anymore. So that degree of socialization and connection is really important for longevity. And, you know, everyone complains about retention and retention costs, you know, over $10,000 per employee. All you have to do is spend that same 10000 to you know, create at least one social activity each quarter or once a year and bring in all your remote workers into one location so they feel connected to the team and organization and they're more likely to stay, which long term will save you more money. How does all of this impact efficiency and productivity? One of the reasons that all of this technology was brought into the workplace was based on the idea that it would create additional efficiencies and productivity. Is it doing that? Yeah, I think in one regard, technology, especially now with artificial intelligence and chatbots, it, it's starting to eliminate the work that we might not admit that we don't even want to do in the first place, which I think is good. And that frees up time for us to do things that leverage our intellect and emotional capital. Uh, I think that's just such a great thing. But at the same time, you know, if you're in a meeting and you're texting someone who's not even in that meeting, why are you even there in the first place? I think that technology can be very distracting. You could be working on a project and then you get a text message or you get a Facebook message or an Instagram direct message and that takes you out of working on that project and then you have to go back in and, and refocus again. And so I think the technology can be used to eliminate the work we don't want to do, but we have to be mindful and careful that it doesn't get in the way of the work we, we're doing at that moment. How does all of this relate to the idea of multitasking, which we've heard so much about for so many years? Multitasking actually doesn't exist. So the research shows that what, what's really happening is your brain is switching from one task to the next and back and forth and back and forth. So it, that can also be very distracting and, and limiting. I think the hard, one of the hardest things for people to do in today's society is to actually really focus because we're living in a world of distractions. I mean, think about your world with the news and, and all the stories and things that are happening in the world and covering them. It's There's just so many outlets. Everything is so fragmented. It's the same with just like people in communication overall. It's 
there's so much coming at you, so many projects you need to do. It's not like people are working less hard now than they did 10 years ago. So with all that pressure, with companies wanting you to do more with less, you get bombarded. And prior research, we found that someone's ability to, to not just delegate tasks, but prioritize work is becoming more and more valued. To be focused is kind of this, the, the new ability in our economy. How does this play out in a really broad, multi-generational workplace where you have an older generation, boomers maybe, that, that are more used to human contact, human interaction, or not so quick to send that email to somebody that's five feet away from them? And then you have the millennial generation, which, which does do that. Talk about how that plays out and what it teaches us. Yeah, so the the research points to the fact that younger people are more using technology more and are more isolated and lonely as a result. And to back that up, there was a, a big study by Cigna of 20,000 adults that not just found that half of Americans are lonely, but what was really fascinating is that young people are are more lonely than senior citizens. So to me, that was really fascinating. And in the workplace with four generations, I think there's a big technological divide. But what I say in the book and what I've told people for over a decade now is let's create real relationships across generations because I think everyone can learn from each other, right? It's about diverse ideas, diversity of thought, you know, getting people who might look different than you or be a different age together because everyone can learn something. And, and I think I think the most important thing when connecting is find people with the same values to form the foundation, but who have a different mindset or come from a different background to challenge your thoughts and opinions, because that's where our true creativity and innovation actually comes from is, is those healthy conflicts. And I think that, I think that while we might think this is a big challenge of connecting people, you're starting to see older generations adopt this technology and, in, in some cases, be more addicted to young than young people. So it's while we might cast a wide net saying, "Oh, it's it's you know affecting young people more," I think the fact is is that everyone now is using the technology to con- communicate. And while it's flattened hierarchies, which is good for collaboration, uh, it can also be very isolating if people don't see how they actually benefit from working with all sorts of people. And talk about the pressures that this puts on leaders of this kind of workplace today. It puts a lot of pressure on a leader. A leader has a huge responsibility now. You know, I don't think it's easy to be a leader. I think it takes real courage. A leader has to instill trust. They have to create a sense of belonging. There's got to be a real purpose behind their work and the work of people who are on their team. And then they need to create a, a happy work environment so people feel like they can bring their best self to work, share their best ideas, and trust their leader so that they're able to uh, be their true self because people don't want to just be the professional and the personal versions of themselves. They just want to be them. Otherwise, there's more pressure and can be conflicting. So I think the leader now has to take a step back and say, okay, well, people are different. They come with you know their own problems and issues and strengths and weaknesses, and we have to pull them in for who they are, respect that, and create an environment where they can be themselves, share ideas, and feel like they're part of a team that is going to support them. To what extent are business schools taking up this problem? Business schools are, I don't see them leading the way on this, right? I think that the most important thing that is actually not taught at schools is how to deal with other people and manage conflicts. And that's what I found through my my previous research is that, you know, young people get into the workplace and they don't really know how to deal with people, not just because they're looking at their screens too much, but because the real life skills that are so important are not learned in undergrad or grad. And that's, that's a, a whole nother conversation about what schools should actually teach, how to get a job, how to manage money and how to deal with people. I mean, that, that's the foundation for, for living. And, and, you know, they're too busy teaching all these other classes when the foundation is, is the key and the core to living a good life. You work with a broad range of companies in lots of different business sectors. Are tech companies understanding these problems first, or are more traditional companies the ones that are really picking up the ball on this? Great question. Technology companies are actually in the way, uh, and I think it's because they feel like it's their duty to do so. So like Apple will tell you how much time you're using on different apps now, uh, even though you know your attention is their asset in a sense. I think that, you know, the big 
tech leaders are keeping their children away from technology, which I think is fascinating because they've created the technology revolution and, and all the innovations that's happened in our world, yet recognize that there's issues and are protecting their parents. So that sends a message to all parents that, hey, if these tech you know, billionaires are doing this, you might want to think twice. And so now, like in society, there's you know different programs and different movements happening to keep your fo- keep phones away from kids until a certain age. And I think that's going to affect culture long term. So it's it's going to be really fascinating how this all pans out. But for sure, technology companies are starting to realize it's their responsibility because the focus and the energy is is on them right now to lead the way, and then other companies will follow. All of this is in the context of where technology is today. What thought has gone into looking at this in terms of future technologies as we have more virtual reality, as AI plays a bigger role, as technology continues to change, and and some of it may be more isolating, some of it may be more connecting. But how is that being looked at in this broader context? Yeah, I look at it all the time. You know, I've read dozens of reports on the impact of artificial intelligence and robots and the economy, and it's hard to get a good read, right? It's, you know, more jobs lost than gained, more jobs uh, created than taken, a net neutral impact to the economy. I've seen everything. The reality is people are going to be working with robots. That's 100%. It's already kind of happening. And machines and AI will eliminate tasks. So there's going to be a lot of pressure on workers to upskill, and that's why you have a company like AT&T investing a billion dollars or more in upskilling their workforce, getting them the new skills that are going to apply uh, to future jobs. So it's, a, it's a really about preparing you know, our country, the, fu- the world for the future, and, and really thinking about that today. And, and there's no question that there's going to be more and more of this, but what I've realized is that all change happens incrementally. You don't wake up in the morning and robots are serving you breakfast. Over time, you get used to interacting with technology, talking to Alexa, and then eventually you get to a point where robots are serving you breakfast. It's just we don't know when things are going to happen, but they will. And so it's much better if you're a listener right now to just start preparing, look at the skills that are going to be required and and start taking classes or getting taught in some, some fashion in order to be positioned for success and take advantage of the technology revolution. What impact are you seeing from the global nature of the workplace? As as the workplace expands, as globalization continues to grow, how is that impacting human connection? Yeah, I've, I've studied in multiple countries. The UK, to me, is the most fascinating. Uh, Nine million people are lonely. Over 200,000 adults haven't spoken to a close friend or relative in the past month. They had a minister of loneliness to take care of the problem. Doctors are prescribing socialization. Uh, in Japan, 30,000 people die a year from uh, loneliness. You know, in Japan, people have virtual reality girlfriends. I think Japan is where we could be in the future. I always look at it as like a futuristic kind of country. And so that's an indication that we might want to be smart now. In China, they have a zombie sidewalk for their hundreds of millions of smartphone users so they don't get hit by a car. Uh, so it's it's really affecting everyone. I think the the healthiest country I studied was Brazil, where they only have like, you know, in terms of like workplace friends and socialization, they're the most social. The least social is Germany, from what I found. But Germany, you know, they have they're fighting for 28 hour work week. So there's a lot of worker protections in France. They have the right to disconnect. They're looking for a four day work week now in the UK and Finland. So I, all the countries are stepping up, and you know, in Japan, that every citizen has Monday mornings off. Countries are stepping up. The U.S. now needs to step up, hopefully. What's happening in Brazil that makes that appreciably different? Do you think? Culture. It's culture. If you go to Brazil, people are partying and lively up until six, seven in the morning. So I think it's cultural that they put a huge emphasis on socialization and and fun. It doesn't that run counter to what employers expect? Doesn't that run counter to efficiency in the workplace? Isn't there a clash that is inevitable in that environment? Yeah, I I think that global companies might operate slightly different there, which could be a concern. So it's, it's interesting. We have such globalization now that, you know, you have these big companies and they have sites everywhere. And so that could conflict with the culture potentially, or the employers are adapting to the culture. Uh, it's early to see how that's going to pan out, but I think it's an ongoing conversation. 
What do psychiatrists and psychologists tell us about the way all of this runs counter to human nature and the way in which human nature can change over time? It's a slow process, certainly even slower than incremental, but nonetheless, we do see it changing. Yeah, I think that what they say and the core foundation of life is after safety, security, food and shelter, people need love and friendships. Otherwise, they won't be self-actualized. And so, you know, all the psychologists, uh, they've done many tests and they've, they've seen the impact of the lack of human connection on the brain and, and functioning. And it really is detrimental to someone's health. And the more people realize that, the more people realize that, you know, the technology could isolate you, could make you unhealthy, the more hopefully they'll wake up and use it for the right reasons. We're not saying don't use technology. You can't not use technology. Otherwise, you'll be irrelevant. It's knowing when, where, and how to use it and, you know, use cases. So if you have to remind a coworker to go to a meeting, a text message makes sense. If you're in an office conflict and you're just texting, it's only going to get worse. I mean, I guess part of what's going on is we're redefining or we may have to redefine what it means to be human in this technological world. Yeah. You know, I think being human is consistent and the technology is what changes. And so as humans, we have to play up our basic human instincts and abilities, knowing that the technologies can remove everything else. And one of the things I got, I had an interesting conversation yesterday uh, and the guy said something smart. It's like, while robots are not going to be creative and innovative because they are programmed to do the same thing every, all the time, right? So they're, they're programmed to go through the same tasks and do the same thing when people are innovative and the best, and what we found through the research is the best, cre- uh, most creative ideas come from conversations. Dan Shaw Bell, his book is Back to Human, How Great Leaders Create Connection in the Age of Isolation. Dan, I thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you.